media en punto que estamos empezando este conversatorio que sigue la proyección del documental canadiense Antropoceno, la era humana o la era de los hombres. Espero que hayan disfrutado al verlo, los que ya lo vieron, si no aprovechen que todavía tienen hasta mañana los que se inscribieron en esto para verlo de forma gratuita y, y ojalá les haya despertado inquietudes y reflexiones que son las que queremos compartir en este espacio. Mi nombre es Manuel Fernández, soy periodista y editor nacional del Mercurio. Quiero agradecer a la Embajada de Canadá por invitarme como moderador de este encuentro. Eh, gracias a la motivación por el libro que recién publicamos con la editorial del Mercurio, que se llama Chile y el cambio climático, la urgencia de actuar, y que es parte de, del tema que nos reúne aquí. Estamos conectados en este momento con los directores del documental, Jennifer Beichwell y Nicolás Defensier, desde Toronto. Un saludo a la distancia que vamos a conversar con ellos en unos minutos, y en Santiago también ustedes pueden ver que estamos con el embajador de Canadá en Chile, Michael Gore, que dirá algunas breves palabras en introducción a este evento. Pero antes de ir a eso, les quiero compartir algunos detalles técnicos. Contamos en esta ceremonia, en este evento, con la traducción simultánea, español, inglés y viceversa. Pueden elegir aquí abajo, en la barra de su Zoom, eh, hay un logo de un planeta, ahí pueden pinchar y pueden cambiar el audio al idioma que ustedes prefieran para que todo funcione mejor. Le, les recomendamos usar la, la función silenciar audio original para que no se les mezclen lo, los sonidos. Eh, también les pedimos que, si les interesó mucho el documental, si tienen preguntas, que las hagan a través del de chat que, está, que aparece aquí en esta misma aplicación. Eh, ojalá nos digan desde qué ciudad nos están viendo, si representan alguna institución, que eso siempre es de ayuda para también conocer el alcance que esté teniendo esta transmisión. Eh, como les decimos, el conversatorio está siendo transmitido en vivo desde la página Facebook de la Embajada de Canadá en Chile y va a prolongarse más o menos durante una hora hasta las nueve y media de la noche. Ahora sí, tengo el agrado de dar la palabra al embajador de Canadá en Chile, el señor Michael Gore, embajador. Muchas gracias por, por esta presentación, uh, Manuel, y, y buenas noches a, a todos y a todas. Eh, seguramente no, no soy la única persona a quien este documental le ha provocado inspiración y generado también preguntas. Así que no quiero quitarles mucho tiempo para poder conversar sobre, sobre ellos. Uh, quisiera eh, compartir algunas palabras, breves palabras, al nombre del Gobierno de Canadá, quien ha organizado este evento, y agradecer también el apoyo de dos socios universitarios en Chile, la Universidad Autónoma y la Universidad de Concepción. Jennifer y Nicolás, me alegra mucho que después de hacer este maravilloso documental y de darnos la oportunidad también de estrenarlo en Chile, puedan también conversar y compartir sus reflexiones y perspectivas con, uh, con nosotros. Yo, como canadiense, su obra uh, y sus contribuciones al diálogo, diálogo ambiental internacional uh, me resultan bastante conocidas y tuve la suerte de ver eh, su ejemplar y magnífica exhibición Uh, de Anthropocene uh, en la Galería uh, Nacional de Arte en Ottawa hace un par de años. Y me enorgullece mucho uh, que como país tengamos a cineastas y expertos de su nivel como embajadores en el mundo. Uh, Manuel, es igual un privilegio tenerte como moderador, eh, tanto por tu experiencia como reconocido editor nacional del Mercurio, un periódico que, que leo todos los días, como por tu conocimiento íntimo de la, del tema de la transformación ambiental y el cambio climático, que recientemente expusiste en tu libro Chile y el cambio climático, la urgencia de actuar. Para Canadá, la protección del medio ambiente, el desarrollo sostenible, y la acción colectiva contra el cambio climático forman una parte integral de nuestras políticas, tanto domésticas como extranjeras. La presentación de hoy es particularmente relevante, ya que Canadá y Chile colaboran en una multitud, en una multitud de temas ambientales, desde el manejo de desechos sólidos hasta la lucha contra el cambio climático, entre otros. 
y comparten un robusto acuerdo de cooperación ambiental desde 1997. Nuestra esperanza, y aquí les doy las gracias a todos los miembros del público que se han unido a participar en esta charla con nosotros hoy, es que películas y diálogos de este tipo alimenten los esfuerzos existentes, identificando, ojalá, nuevas áreas donde podemos colaborar juntos. Manuel, Jennifer y Nicolás, muchas gracias otra vez por conversar con nosotros hoy. Gracias, embajador. Gracias por esas palabras, por introducir esta conversación que esperamos que les interese. Y si, como les decía, si quieren participar, envíen sus preguntas a través de, del chat que está disponible. Ahí nos van a estar reenviando las preguntas del público para poder hacerse a nuestros invitados. Bueno, vamos a la conversación eh, sobre Antropoceno, la era humana, este documental que fue el fruto del trabajo de cuatro años de los realizadores que nos acompañan desde su casa en Ontario. Eh, un trabajo que lideraron los realizadores Jennifer Bakewell y Nicolás de Tencier junto al fotógrafo Edward Burton. <coughs> Quería, a propósito, para darles la bienvenida a nuestros invitados, a Jennifer y Nick, eh, que partamos por el contexto. Eh, este documental une de alguna manera, ciencia con arte, eh, a través del trabajo, de, del, valga la redundancia, del grupo de trabajo sobre el antropoceno. Creo que sería bueno para que estemos todos en la misma página, en el fondo, que nos explicaran bien en qué consiste ese grupo de trabajo, y cómo se vincula con este documental, y por qué les pareció necesario abordar desde el lenguaje audiovisual un concepto como el del antropoceno. Well, first of all, we, we, we were very happy to be with you all and thank you to everybody who is viewing and thanks especially um, to the embassy and the ambassador for inviting us and, and to you for uh, having this conversation with us, uh, this vital conversation. Um, I think we can both answer that question, but we'll start with this film is part of a trilogy of films that we made with the photographer Edward Bertinsky. And the first film was Manufactured Landscapes about his photographic essay of the Industrial Revolution in China. And the second film was called Watermark about people's interaction with water all over the world. And we were talking about whether or not to do a third project. And there were different possibilities. There was an oil, an essay on oil that, that Ed did. And we thought about that. And, Uh, these are big projects, they're, they're international projects and they, they have big themes. And um, I was sort of trying to think of what, what the way of getting into the Anthropocene would be. And when Ed and I were walking in Washington, actually, after a screening of Watermark uh, on the streets, and it was the spring and holy, all the blossoms, the beautiful um, uh, blossoms were out. And, And he said, should we do something again? And I said, what about the Anthropocene? Nobody knows what that word means. <laughs> and, and that was um, how we started this conversation. I think taking a cue from the scientists of the Anthropocene working group um, who have been tasked with trying to establish if there's enough proof and evidence to officially ratify the Anthropocene as a unit of time in the geological time scale. Um, now I think that the, the concept of the fact that humans now change the Earth's systems more than all the natural systems combined, um, it's more known than it was four years ago when we were starting this, um, but we wanted to be part of that um, transmission of the scientific evidence and of the scientific research. Uh, and we knew it would be a huge project. We filmed on every continent except Antarctica, and it's a, it's a global problem, a global dynamic. So we knew that um, we, we, uh, we needed all of our teams, Edward's teams, our teams, and it would, be, it would be a huge project. And we also wanted to collaborate with the scientists and take their research, their data, their graphs, their academic, uh, filter onto this issue 
And as filmmakers and photographers and artists try and translate that uh, into the mediums that we know. And you know, they, they wrote a book that was published by Cambridge University Press, which I'm sure you've seen. And we spent a great deal of time with the scientists at, at their meetings. We went to two, you know, three day meetings. We, we visited individual scientists in, the, in Europe and in the United States and in Canada. And, and yet the film is not, as you all know, as you all have seen, it is not a bunch of scientists talking about um, the Anthropocene. It is about trying to make their research real for ordinary people in the way, like us, lay people, nobody, I don't know how many people are gonna read that Cambridge University Press book and it's very dense and it's full of graphs and it's full of scientific language. And we thought, is there a way of translating that research in a meaningful way and in a way that respected the integrity of the research, but doing it in such a way that could actually move people, uh, not just so they understood it intellectually, but so that they emotionally understood it, they viscerally understood it, and they experientially understood it. Sin duda hay un, una alianza muy virtuosa entre lo que puede ser el, la, el aporte científico y el aporte artístico para, para motivar a la acción. Eh, quería entrar como a las reflexiones que a uno como espectador le quedan después de ver un trabajo como este que que es muy impactante en general. Eh, y, y creo que me gustaría partir eh, con una observación que tiene que ver como con el tono que adoptan al, al abordar el, el fenómeno del antropoceno. Eh, es evidente que ustedes tienen un punto de vista, obviamente, al respecto. Hay imágenes que muestran que son de gran crudeza, de situaciones que pueden ser consideradas horribles, como la caza ilegal de elefantes, la destrucción de entornos naturales, esos mega basurales, la destrucción de patrimonio cultural, etc. Pero lo que me llamó la atención es que adoptan un tono que no es condenatorio, por una parte, que no es como, de, miren qué mal pasa esto, sino que hay, hay un tono diferente, más de mostrar, de, de pausas, que invitan a la reflexión. Y por otro lado, también hay una permanente búsqueda de una belleza estética, incluso en las situaciones que se pueden considerar más horribles, digamos. Eh, ¿Por qué toman esa decisión de, de abordar con esa mirada eh, eh, tan estética este fenómeno? I think part of the power of documentary is that it, it has a foot in the, the power of journalism, of translating the real, of using the real world and real places uh, in, in, the, in the story that you're telling but that there's also the possibility to um, add a creative lens to that. Um, and so I, I think for us, when we were trying to make um, uh, a film that was a witness to the human effect on the planet, um, we, we didn't want to get in the way. And there's lots of wonderful polemical films that uh, take a point of view, that make an argument, that are more like an essay, that we all learn a lot from. And we wanted uh, this film to be different, partly because so much of our discourse is polarized, our political discourse, our environmental discourse. There's a lot of people who have retreated into their camps and don't want to look at other points of view. And we didn't want this just to fall into another environmental film or an activist film. Um, because the problems are complex and they will need all of us on all sides of political spectrums and from all walks of life and from all over the world to meet these challenges. So we tried to be um, more of, of, of a taking the audience there and witnessing these places. And hopefully then it's more of a dialogue that you have as a viewer where the meaning isn't always fixed. You're not being told what to think, um, but you're hopefully having your consciousness raised by visiting places that you might be responsible for, that we're all responsible for in some sense, but you might not otherwise know about. And that was the philosophy of this film. Or ever go to these places. Um, and just regarding the beauty, you know, there's something about um, if, 
if people see things that they do not agree with, they often just turn away. And there's something about the aesthetic element when we find you know, the biggest land machine on the planet, which is the bagger that you see in the German mine, um, which is massive and completely overwhelming to be around. When you experience that in a way that is non-judgmental, but also aesthetically compelling, it draws you in to thinking about it more. And I think that, that it's easy for us to, to push away things that are, are disturbing. I mean, there's enough things that are disturbing in life <laughs> to, that, that you don't want to engage with that. But when something intrigues you aesthetically, it brings you in in a way that I think creates an openness for that shift in consciousness to occur. Okay. A propósito de ese caso, hay una coincidencia bien interesante entre algunos de los entrevistados que aparecen en el documental, el minero del litio, el trabajador de la planta rusa, el operario de esta mega excavadora alemana, todos dicen lo mismo, están orgullosos de su trabajo, eh, están felices con lo que hacen, entusiasmados con la oportunidad de generar una carrera profesional, con aportar a la electromovilidad, fascinados por el poder de la máquina que manejan, eh, eh, entonces aquí me da la impresión que hay algo muy profundo, eh, no sé si les parece, estaremos perdiendo a veces la visión del conjunto, a veces estamos tan fascinados con los progresos materiales, que, que hace posible el, el poder humano, que pese a todo el discurso en la práctica, preferimos no mirar el impacto de nuestras actividades y de nuestros lujos de la vida moderna. This is exactly for me why the scientists were so fascinating because we, in, in our technological age, we're bombarded with, with short messages that risk being superficial on our social media feeds in the churn of the news cycle that now is almost instantaneous. Um, if you're a scientist in the Anthropocene Working Group, a lot of them are geologists. They think in very deep time And, and they think of the whole planet and its tiny place in, in the universe. And they think of what things that humans do, you know, will still be in the rock record as fossils long after humans are gone. The tunnels that we build, all of the, the earth that we move, all these ways that we transform the planet with our, with our signature. And exactly like you say, for me, that was such a refreshing perspective to go way, way back and have a really big picture um, perspective on where we are now as a species on this planet. And I think that was unique and a real a draw for us as artists. De, de la variedad de ejemplos que ustedes muestran, se deduce que el impacto humano en el entorno no es como patrimonio de un solo sistema económico político. Eh, tenemos países con democracias plebiscitarias ejemplares como Suiza, dictaduras como China, países desarrollados como Estados Unidos en vías de desarrollo como Rusia, muy subdesarrollados como Kenia, países capitalistas, países comunistas, países con estados de bienestar. Eh, si esto va más allá de nuestra estructura sociopolítica, ¿quiere decir que perciben que hay algo como en la naturaleza humana eh, eh, que, que está detrás de este afán por transformar el entorno a veces de maneras dramáticas? Y si es así, ¿cómo podríamos evitar o controlar al menos los efectos más nefastos de esta tendencia que tenemos como seres humanos? Well, people do say that, that every species expands to its maximum allowable footprint. And that's just the drive of the species. And certainly uh, we are doing that. Um, Uh, but we have the, the, the help of things like fossil fuels to keep us going. And I think that um, as, a, as a species, yes, there are these, these similarities, but I don't think you can say to people, it's wrong to want to feed your family or, 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 or have a good life. You, you can't do that. This is a complex issue. And I will say that we were all over the world, but there are certainly different degrees of guilt and implication in terms of, of, of creating the problems. You know, it is absolutely certain that the global north has a much 
bigger footprint um, it, 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 in, it, regardless of anything else than many other places in the world. And global inequalities are, are exacerbated by these environmental inequalities. And so the, I think that there is a complexity to the problem that we are not trying to say there is an easy answer to that. And certainly neither are the, are the Anthropocene working group scientists. But I think that we as a, as a species have a capacity um, for understanding and for hope. And many people ask us, you know, you must be so depressed after going to all of these places and seeing this destruction. And, and I always answer by saying, actually, I am full of hope because everywhere we went, there were either people living with dignity in very difficult circumstances, Norilsk, you know, um, talking about the, the beauty of a flower coming through the stone, people living in, in the, the uh, landfill site uh, or adjacent to the landfill site in Nairobi, and people who, for example, at the London Zoo have been spending the past two years raising mountain chicken frog babies to be reintroduced into the wild in the Caribbean to try to propagate that species which is endangered. And so I think that we have the capacity, we just have to have the will um, to, to change and we have to apportion the responsibility for acting um, to, to those players and those actors who are, are, are more culpable. And, and I think we need to be uh, much stronger about that than we are. Hay, hay un juego de imágenes de, de bueno, muchas que a uno lo impactan en el documental que, que me llamó mucho la atención cuando vemos primero la, la industria forestal canadiense muy mecanizada, muy tecnificada, máquinas explotando un, un bosque en un país que desde Chile por lo menos nosotros percibimos como mucho eh, más desarrollado y mucho más consciente de los desafíos medioambientales y, y vemos que ya choca un poco que en ese país pase eso. Eh, primer momento chocante, pero luego hay un corte y nos vamos a África, a Nigeria, y vemos esa misma explotación con medios mucho más precarios, de personas que arrasan la riqueza de sus bosques, que probablemente es la mayor riqueza de la que disponen, y, y ¿para qué? O sea, como que la pregunta que uno se pregunta, ni siquiera parecemos ver la esperanza de un progreso en sus condiciones de vida, o, o una justificación del sacrificio que están, que están haciendo, vemos, ustedes muestran una ciudad caótica, donde parece que mandar el más fuerte, como que no, no hay una gran calidad de vida. ¿Qué sensación les dejó a usted este tipo de contraste? ¿Y, y qué buscaban también al generar esta juxtaposición, este encuentro de, 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 de imágenes tan, tan, tan violento a veces? Well, I think the film does try to embrace the complexity of our current situation globally and all of these are examples that fit into the research, research categories of the Anthropocene Working Group um, but that also hopefully if the film is successful um, teach us about these global dynamics and it's really important to us that the film is not pointing a finger here what, what you're doing is bad or what you're doing is bad um, And so for us to include the scene from Canada, that's the one place where maybe we can point We're the finger. Allowed. We're allowed to point the finger yeah, to Canada um, and say, we should not be cutting old growth forests anymore, period. Yeah. Uh, we're um, happy to say that. But, you know, with, if you think of, of the, the mine in Norilsk in Russia, it's, it's the largest col colored metals mine and processing facility in the world. And there's no question that our devices, maybe even this computer, uh, have the products of that mine. So it's, it, it's not to say, look, what's happening over there is bad. It's to make us all, all contemplate our implication um, and hopefully through that consciousness work towards more positive dynamics. But we also live in the real world, um, all of us, and it's not going to be easy. Uh, especially that economic issue that, that you bring up, 
uh, we can't just all transition to a whole new paradigm tomorrow uh, because certain people will just go off a cliff economically. Uh, and so it, it needs to be a very conscious and as you say, a um, very collaborative effort globally. And that goes against our human nature to be competitive and to expand as far as we can. Um, I think we need to engage more that, that side of our human nature that is collaborative, altruistic, um, and uh, working together. And in a way, this film tries to, tries to echo that virtuous circle of working together by trying to be interdisciplinary, by trying to reach out to scientists and collaborate with them across mediums uh, and to reach out to other kinds of artists and, and, um, and then eventually to audiences and to journalists as well and try and have th this project and the images and the films be a, a touchstone for conversations that go far, far beyond this film. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think it, there's also a point to be made that, and I think COVID has taught us, this pandemic has taught us that there are no borders really, um, and, and we're all in it together. <laughs> and when, it, when Nick talks about acting altruistically, in a way, it's a mutual altruism. We're benefiting each other when, when um, and, and I think that that, uh, that kind of ethic certainly has to be something that we all adopt. And if, if, if we haven't had a great reset because of the pandemic, then I, I'm not sure what would um, take us to a level to understand how connected we actually all are as people. I did just want to say something about um, the ethics of engagement and us as filmmakers from Canada going all over the world um, filming. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a tricky thing to do ethically. And I, I, I want to state that our, our philosophy of filmmaking, uh, and that there's, this is also one of the reasons why the people who speak in the film are the people who live in these contexts that we are trying to convey. They're not experts pronouncing from above. And I feel that if we are going to say anything true or convey anything true about these places that we go to, it requires an enormous amount of humility and, and an ethical uh, stance in the way that we enter into these communities and contexts and let uh, try to create, be a conduit for that story instead of imprinting our own ideas upon them. And it's not an easy thing to do because you're, you know, you're, you're spending a lot of money to go to these places. Sometimes we had very big crews with us, you know, people who were, we were doing augmented reality, photography, 360 virtual reality, film, all at the same time. And yet what that requires is a relinquishing of control and a submitting to the reality of that place. And so um, when you talk about the chaos of, of Lagos, Lagos is one of the fastest growing cities in the world. What does that look like? What is the reality of that place? You can't understand it from above looking down. You have to get on the street and you have to be walking in the street with the people who live there. And, and I think that, that that constant sort of back and forth between the wide picture and the very particular view is a really important way of, of conveying the reality of those places. Voy a colgarme de lo último que tú decías sobre lagos eh, y, y, y usar alguna de las preguntas que nos han llegado del público. Una es eh, cuánto tiempo aproximadamente estaban en cada lugar en el cual en el cual filmaron para para alcanzar ese nivel de involucramiento y, y la otra es ¿Cuáles fueron los principales desafíos que enfrentaron durante la producción o la filmación del, del documental? Imagino que hay lugares donde no debe haber sido fácil tener los permisos o, o, o alcanzar la confianza con la gente. Yeah, I think it ties in to what Jennifer was just saying about the, philo the philosophy of filmmaking. And we don't work from a script. We don't, we don't try and write the film beforehand. Instead, 
we spent in this case almost almost a year doing research um, to try to educate ourselves as much as possible about the places where we might go and then also choosing those places and we had a, an office with a big a studio with a big wall full of pictures and all of the research categories and trying to find ones that that would be representative sometimes the biggest sometimes the ones that had the most visual power because we work in a visual medium first and foremost um, and that research is really important in a way so that you can arrive on the site and be the most open to the possibilities of what's actually there uh, so that so that you know hopefully you have an almost unconscious feeling about about where you are um, but there's also a lot of very boring work uh, uh, that is probably the biggest challenge in making a film like this. And that's all of the trying to get permissions, trying to get access. You know, if, if you're a, a dirty lignite coal mine in Germany, which bills itself and, and has a very good success record of lots of clean energy, um, you, you have a lot to lose by letting a camera crew in to your site and it took us a long long time because we just kept bugging them and bugging them and bugging them and we well, wouldn't we wouldn't but, start wait i have to show this but picture. but but we also um you know we hope that the that our approach that that it's not an accusatory approach yes. that it's an approach that involves all of us um brings in a wider uh you know audience and um, even people who might think they're not environmentalists and as well, you know, would, would allow uh, the places who did let us in and give us access, access. But that's a lot of work and probably the biggest, one of the biggest challenges in answer to that question. I think Jen has no, another so, picture. So, so I just wanna show you all, this, this is Nick and me after we've been fingerprinted in um, Norilsk. Uh, because we were detained uh, by the government for, they claimed that we came into Norilsk under false pretenses. Norilsk is a closed city, even to Russians. And so we came in under, under a cultural visa because we were doing this art project and we explained what it was, it's film, it's art, you know, it's photographs, it's an exhibition. But then when we went into the um, smelter and interviewed the crane operators, the women, who were on their coffee break and I, I, I wanted to talk to them. I wanted to know what their lives were like. And we got in so much trouble for doing that because they said, well, only journalists interview people. Um, that, 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 so you must be journalists and you're here on, under false pretenses. And we said, no, we're, we're, this is an art film. It's a film. We're talking to these people. We're not trying to expose anything. Uh, so sometimes we get into issues like that, political issues, and then also just the, you know, the dangers of being on, on sites that are sometimes quite precarious. In, in, in Watermark, we were filming at a dam where we, had, we were on these very precarious ladders with our equipment looking down at you know, thousands of feet drop. If you fell, you would die. But then we have to remind ourselves, we're only there for five days, 10 days, there are people who live and work here all the time. They're in this world all the time. So if, if we can't hack it for, you know, uh, a short time, then, then we shouldn't be doing this job, basically. Perfecto. Hay un documental, una, una, varios momentos que invitan a la reflexión como sobre el sentido de las cosas. De, de, ¿Por qué estamos haciendo esto? Eh, cuando en Alemania uno ve un país desarrollado, digamos, que derriban tres pueblos, una iglesia del siglo XIX, para ampliar una mina de carbón, eh, que es un combustible que está en franca decadencia, en retirada, eh, la angustia que se genera yo creo que es muy impactante, es una de las imágenes probablemente más potentes del, del documental. Y uno ahí se pregunta por el sentido de eso. Se pregunta también al principio cuando ve esa infinidad de... De, de cuernos de elefantes, digamos, eh, por, el, por qué existe un mercado de eso, de marfil. Eh, ¿Acaso como para ver cómo al final ustedes muestran a, a este artesano que, que talla en, 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 un, en, un, eh, en un cuerno el, 
una obra que probablemente puedan comprar dos o tres personas en el mundo por, por lo costoso que es. Eh, no sé, ¿cómo, cómo desarrollaron ustedes? ¿Qué, qué, ¿Qué reflexiones les pasaban a ustedes al ver eh, esto? Al ver estas cosas que parecen no tener sentido cuando uno las ve en el conjunto, digamos que donde, donde la, el impacto de una acción parece no tener ninguna correlación con el costo que esta genera eh, en el planeta. I think it's it's the purpose of the film and the ambition of the film is to raise exactly the issues that you're talking about that um, uh, through whatever kind of um, I don't know is it ultra rational or uh, you know but by by putting ourselves in situations where we don't consider the the whole implications of our actions, whatever they are, we can do a lot of damage and ultimately a lot of damage to ourselves as we get close to the carrying capacity of this whole planet. Um, and so to, to be able to, exactly like you say, take a step out of the, well, it, we're in Germany, we need power, so where's the, we're gonna burn coal, but without doing the full cost accounting of what it means to burn coal um, and, the, and the CO2 emissions and the terrible pollution, um, because it's, town. yeah, the, the destruction of the towns, right? I mean, that's such a strong metaphor, I think, for this blindness that we can have as humans, this ability to compartmentalize away things that we don't want to see because it's somehow not convenient. It's easier just to go ahead on a wrong path sometimes. And, and, and this is a very dangerous dynamic for, for, for humans we're finding. So one of the ambitions of the film is to try and break out of that small view into the big view so that we might be able to change some of the things that we do. Well, and the long-term view instead of the short-term view. The short-term view of, of cutting down an old growth tree for to make somebody's deck in their backyard uh, versus the ecosystem services that kind of a tree can provide for centuries. W why would anybody do that? There's this short term thinking that is very much driven by, you know, uh, global economic models. Um, and the, the other part that it takes us back to that, that idea that the film is trying to allow us to witness places we are responsible for but would never normally see. And I think that when you see Germany, that, you know, which is supposed to be a, a leader in environmental um, uh, energy, in, in, in clean energy, that they actually have one of the large, that was the largest open pit coal mine in Germany, and that they've destroyed these places and lignite is not a very efficient coal. So it's very, um, it, it's, it's dirty to burn. And you think, wow, that's the short term gain that we're, that we're going after here. And what, what I also want to, to, to remind everyone that I kept sort of being, it was a revelation to me during filming is that this is not, these are not otherworldly landscapes. They might look like they're on the moon, but this is business as usual. These are places that are operating 24 hours a day in order to uh, give us the palladium we need in Norilsk for our cell phones and our computers, to, to, to process the, the waste, the things that we throw away, whatever away is, what does away mean? There is no away. The things we throw away every day in these massive landfill sites and the materials that we are constantly seeking. And so it really is that idea of trying to think in geological time and to think that, wow, we as a species now are so dominant that every system is controlled by us in a way that is going to a bad place. And, and we, we have to do something about it collectively. Nos preguntan del público eh, a propósito de ese proceso que Nick mencionaba de, de estar estudiando los lugares. ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo tomaron las decisiones en la práctica, bien concreto, de decir aquí vamos, aquí no vamos? 
eh, que, que los llevó a los lugares específicos que muestran en el documental. You know, we're, we're very lucky taking on a project this big uh, in this modern day and age because satellites basically have an eye on the entire <laughs> planet all the time. So we can learn quite a lot about a place through lots of different kinds of research, but especially visual research and, and in a film, and especially a film like this, where there's hopefully only just enough text and words to, to give you the key to each room uh, that we were taking you to, to each scene. Um, but really the story is told through the visuals. Um, we needed to know that, uh, that the places that we chose would be visually interesting and could tell their own story just by showing them, that they wouldn't need a lot of explanation. You know, we have potash mines in, in Canada, um, but they don't have that incredible, rich, psychedelic, multicolored red and blue pattern that you just can't believe, where you see millennia of ocean floor deposits uh, and then how they've crystallized chemically and changed color into these reds and blues. So of course we wanted to go there to tell that story because it's visually fascinating. So it, it, it was a whole matrix of things that included the visual interest, trying to represent as many different parts of the world as possible. So we didn't spend too much time in, in just one part of the world, but had a true global dynamic. And then I think where it fit in and resonated the research of the Anthropocene Working Group the most. So hopefully there would be layers in every place. It just wouldn't be visual. But if you thought about it, or if you thought about the story, you, you could go several layers deep. And the tusk burn is an example of that because um, it's a very complex story uh, in that it looks like uh, like a horror film, you're burning the tusks of these majestic animals who have died um, at the hands of, of humans, and yet it's a positive story. It's, it's the organizers and Dr. Winnie Carew, who's in the film, was really the main proponent of this idea that we cannot store this ivory. Um, it's, it's a burden to everyone, and if we make a statement by burning it and invite all the world's press to send these images around the world, um, more people will become aware. And there are very positive, tangible outcomes from that ivory burn, as horrible as it was to think about and sometimes to witness, um, it, it, was, it was a strong enough statement to have a real outcome. I, I will say that the, it all started with the science, as Nick said, and we had all of the categories of research on that wall. So, terraforming, anthroturbation, population, extinction, um, uh, technofossils, a word that we did not know what that meant until we started to work with these scientists, just human created objects and waste. And the, the technosphere is the, the entirety of the built environment, the human environment that, that now is so vast um, around the world world, cement, etc. And so we started with those categories. And then we had all of these potential candidates for sort of, you know, explaining, as Nick says, in visual ways, that, um, that particular category. And in the end, we sifted through, and there were some things that we didn't end up using, which I still feel kind of sad about, like the we have this beautiful scene at the, at, at the oldest seed bank in the world in Petersburg, and, and it just, it was just one story too many. But I have to remind you when you brought up the, the tusks, um, Nick was talking about the paradox of the tusk burn, but the carver in Hong Kong, the tusks that he is now carving are mammoth tusks. They are not elephant tusks because elephant carving elephant ivory is illegal. And so in one way, that's really good that, that he has moved on to mammoth tusks. But the irony is that the only reason these mammoth tusks are being revealed is because the permafrost is melting 
because of climate change so that they are they are able to be taken out of the earth so you're left with this again a complex situation kind of a paradox but uh, we think people can we're, we're, we're not going to reduce it and and uh, turn it into a black and white situation when it is not ese, ese precisamente el, el tema de mostrar la complejidad de los conceptos es algo es una tentación que ustedes ven que es difícil de reducir cuando uno intenta dar una mirada eh, desde el punto de vista del arte de, de estas problemáticas globales cuánto les costó eso cuánta lucha interna hubo revelatory yeah. rather than accusatory we we have lots of friends who are activists who say maybe we don't go far enough um but for us i i think the the inclusivity and the um uh collaboration like i say is hopefully an example if 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 everyone's just accusing everyone else uh, like is happening so much in the world now um i i think that's that's not the way forward so i think it it represents our our approach to the solutions uh, that we're all going to have to come up with um and it was it was difficult sometimes to be in these places of course and to contemplate the weight of of a lot of suffering uh in the world now and potential in the future even worse um uh you know this is a this is a very heavy topic um and yet uh, the most affirming thing about making the film was to feel like and to hope that that our actions were maybe positive and so you could throw yourself into the work and work as hard as you possibly could to tell this story and that was an antidote to becoming um depressed or getting into a negative uh you know mindset or feeling despair at the scale of all of our challenges um the fact even in our very small way to at least be doing something uh was was really positive and i think gave us energy and hopefully that same positive energy will be transmitted to lots of people in lots of different ways if they think of ways in their life or their work uh that they can not just throw their hands up in despair but to get active and to work for positive change however they can we're filmmakers so we made a film and we'll continue to work in film about these issues um and everyone else hopefully can look at their own lives and what their capacities are and and hopefully do something positive in that way well and also we would be hypocritical if we were accusing others because look we live in toronto we have we traveled all over the world for this film just our energy footprint for making this film um we did offset. we we now we offset our films we do a carbon offset of our films and we've done it since uh payback which was what year was that um and and we 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 really had to fight to start doing that it was early days and now more and more films can do it so you calculate your carbon footprint not just the travel but the post production we even calculated it for the exhibition and the film being screened around the world to to try to do something but if you ask me do i think that the the benefit of the film or the film has had enough of an impact to justify that carbon footprint i don't i still don't know the answer to that so so we can we're not in any position to to accuse our our we we want to open up consciousness about about how we live and and the impacts that it has and how far reaching it is everywhere so that we can all figure out various ways small ways big ways to change together cuál cuál dirían ustedes que fue uno su escena favorita de la del documental pueden no estar de acuerdo entre ustedes <ríe> y dos eh cuál es el lugar que ustedes cuando estuvieron ahí más impacto les causó <ríe> 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 
it's it's a great privilege uh, to be able to visit these places that not a lot of people visit and i would have trouble choosing um one over over the others um i'm really glad that we got access to so many places that that we worked hard to do there's not a lot of nuanced stories that i see coming out of russia uh, and that was very difficult. I didn't think that that they would give us the permission in the end, um, but they did, and so that's included. And I'm I'm very happy about that. Um, and um, uh, I don't know. Do you have a, a like a favorite? Well, it's it's a bit hard to say favorite. Like I I one thing that I and we actually fought about this, and you the audience may not know that we're married um so we're partners in life and work which can be complicated but um i wanted to go to the to the zoological society of london to the london zoo to to um explore all of the animals that are either extinct in the wild or critically endangered and nick said we can't film at a zoo <laughs> like we're going all over the world and you want to go to a zoo in london and i said i really think that that is for me the emotional apex of the film when you are seeing all of these species that are so incredible ending with the elephants of course that we have driven to the point of extinction through our own selfishness and habitat loss etc so that to me um, I, 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 he was skeptical and, and I'm glad we shot that. So I guess I could say that would be my favorite. And then the, the one that was the most devastating to me, not because it was the most difficult environment, but I grew up in British Columbia in BC. And I, you know, we still have this idea of Canada as a country of natural resources. But if, if we really believe that we can base an economy on the exploitation of those natural resources in an unsustainable way, we're going to end up like the Lorax, which is this Dr. Seuss book where all the trees get cut down and there's just a factory and there's nothing left. So seeing those old growth trees um, turn into clear cuts it was absolutely devastating for me because I grew up thinking that the forest was all around me and I might touch a tree one day that nobody else had touched because it was pristine forest. It doesn't exist anymore. And, and, and that, was, that was devastating to me to think that, that we're, we, we would really think of such short-term gain, gain in, uh, to, to do something so violent. Una pregunta que nos llega de nuestro público es que, lo que la conclusión que nuestro eh, público dice es que la forma en que los seres humanos trabajan en el planeta pareciera ser muy caótica, la forma en que transforman el planeta, perdón, pareciera ser muy caótica. Eh, y, y veo un poco lo que tú dices, este, este choque entre la mirada de corto plazo y las miradas de mayor largo plazo. ¿Piensan ustedes con lo que vieron en su recorrido, con el trabajo que han hecho con los científicos, que va a ser posible algún día que tengamos una mirada más integral de nuestro desarrollo, eh, pareciera ser que es el único camino, pero no parece ser tan evidente como, como tomarlo. The answer is that we have no choice, um, because we've reached an unprecedented time. As Jennifer was saying, the, the, the pristine nature is almost non-existent now. And both in Chile and in Canada, we are examples of humans expanding when the home that they had been managing, the countries that they had been managing, had exceeded their carrying capacity. And before in history, there was always somewhere where you could go to, where you could expand to, and you could emigrate to. Um, and obviously, there's a whole uh, complicated history of that with colonialism. Um, but as Europeans came to the Americas, the, the, the histories of both of our, of, of our countries, it did represent for them new possibilities. Um, but now there is no nowhere else that we can go. So we have reached the maximum on the planet and we have to stop looking out and over a horizon that doesn't exist and start looking 
at each other uh, and at ourselves and solve these problems. Um, so do I believe that, that we can? I believe that, that we must. That's, that's the only answer. El, ¿cuál, ¿Cuál dirían ustedes, en, para ir ya acercándonos al cierre de nuestro conversatorio, ¿cuál dirían ustedes que es el gran mensaje que les gustaría que la gente se quedara una vez que ve el documental? Eh, más allá de la angustia que pueden generar algunas imágenes o del pesimismo, como decía en algún momento, ¿cuál, cuál es la, el mensaje o la reflexión que a ustedes más les gustaría motivar? I mean, the, the narration at the end of the film, and I, I will say that the narration was added sort of towards the midway through the edit process, and we were not sure if we were going to do it. And I, I really wanted it to be a woman's voice because narration is almost always a guy, you know, it's always almost always a booming man's voice, you know, the voice of God. And I didn't want that. And we were very happy that Alicia Vikander agreed to do the narration because she's a voice of hope. She's a, she's a young person, you know, and a voice of hope. Um, but what we say at the, at the end there and writing it, it was very hard to write this in a way that was kind of not preachy and gave enough information. But that was the one place where we really allowed that perspective. And that is to say that there is no question that we have the capacity as a species to change for the better. We, we need a collective will to do so. And when we do galvanize around something like creating a COVID vaccine, we can do it. We, we do it and, and, and we are able to solve those problems. When we are still in the throes of, of global economic systems that are unfair and unequal and rely on the oppression of others or the environmental destruction of places for what I said before, the short-term gain. Um, I think it's a, a, a huge reset that is needed um, and will become, as Nick says, not a choice, but a necessity. We're already at that point with climate change, with the effects of climate change. We're already there. We're dealing with it all of the time. Are we just putting our finger in the, I mean, just trying to like stave off the, the, the tsunami? Yes, but we're, we're inevitably going to have to move beyond that. And if we don't, and I don't mean to sound cynical about this because if we go down as a species, we're taking so many others down with us, all, all the other species and all of the people who are, are minimally responsible for the environmental destruction that, that I would say still a relatively small percentage um, of, of the world has wrought. So unless we can start holding those people accountable and not allowing them to lobby our governments and uh, in ways that are, 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 are uh, corrupt, um, we won't change, but we, do, we can do it. We can see, um, we, we, we can see change. There was somebody, there was this article by Erica Chenoweth who wrote that it only takes a fraction of the population to actually institute meaningful change, a fraction of a, um, a dedicated uh, vocal group to, to inform others and then galvanize change. Look at Greta Thunberg as, a, a, as an example of that. So we can do it. I have hope that we can and, uh, and we'll have to at some point. Lynn Jennifer, estamos llegando al final. Les quería hacer una última pregunta muy breve. Eh, ¿Viene una cuarta parte en esta saga de documentales? ¿Qué tienen en mente? ¿O, o, o todavía to no cierran el ciclo de Antropocene? Um, it's such a big project that it has a, a wonderful long tail and there's an education program and um, the, the scenes and images uh, still get repurposed and get used by environmental groups and 
and um, I think still ripple out into the world. We're freelance filmmakers, so we we always have to be working, and uh, we're working on different projects. And we're we're definitely uh, working towards a project that is, in a way, the answer to where this one leaves off. Um, that is more about solutions, more about the positive ways. I think at some point you you have to cross the threshold of trying to raise people's consciousness and realize that to move forward, you'll have to leave some people behind, but you just have to move forward. And so I, I'm hoping that our next project is very much about positive solutions to the challenges of the Anthropocene that we can all get behind. Or, or, or a comedy. We'll, we'll do a, we'll, we'll make a comedy for once because it would be nice to, 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 to distract people from <laughs> Pase muy interesante hoy. Les quería agradecer a Nick y a Jennifer por, por esta hora de conversación que nos han regalado a propósito de, de, de este documental. Realmente ha sido muy interesante. Les quiero agradecer a ustedes, a la Universidad Autónoma de la Universidad de Concepción, que han apoyado esta actividad organizada por la eh, Embajada de Canadá en Chile. Eh, me quería despedir eh, agradeciéndoles también a todos los que han participado desde sus casas en este conversatorio. Sin duda ha sido Súper interesante. Muchas gracias una vez más a Jennifer y a Nick. Nos estaremos viendo en, en la cuarta parte de esta saga y muy buenas noches. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you for the translation. Yes. Muchas gracias para el Very tradición. good translation. And uh, yes, hopefully in person. In person next time um, uh, would, be, would be wonderful. Ojalá. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody.